Today we're going to talk about preventing the complications of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, which some of you may know is ESRD, but that's no longer that's no longer the politically correct nomenclature. So on July 10th of 2019, the President of the United States signed an executive order um, to initiate a program called Advancing American Kidney Health. And there were three goals, and this will help explain to some degree one of the purposes of this talk. The first goal was to reduce the number of Americans developing kidney failure by 25% by 2030. And you'll see how we're gonna do on that and why um, primary care physicians are gonna play a major role in that um, given the number of nephrologists. Secondly, to ensure that 80% of new kidney failure patients in 2025 are either on home dialysis or are receiving a transplant. And you're about to see whether, what the numbers are and you can judge for yourself whether that's pie in the sky or realistic. And then the third goal is to double the number of kidneys available for transplant by 2030. So end-stage kidney disease is very expensive to the government and is the only specific disease that's covered under Medicare, regardless of how old you are. And the USRDS is the United States Renal Data System. So ESRD probably has more and better data than any other disease that we encounter on a regular basis because um, physicians and dialysis facilities are required under law to um, report a variety of information to the government. Um, and they put out an ADR, which is short for annual data report, <clears throat> The last one was in 2019, and there's a two-year lag for the data. So that's why all the data you see here are 2017. So ESKD care costs about 49 to $50 billion a year for Medicare fee to Medicare. Um, the fee-for-service piece is about 35.9. And here's the number that should catch your attention. So 7.2% of the total Medicare spending is represented by ESKD care, but ESKD patients are less than 1% of the Medicare population. Currently, there are about three quarters of a million people uh, with ESKD in the US. And you can see the cost of care, and it should be quickly evident that hemodialysis um, is the most expensive way to go, followed by peritoneal dialysis and then transplant. Now, remember that goal of 80% being on either home, hem home dialysis or having a preemptive transplant. Um, so in 2017, there were 124,500 new ESKD patients. Um, only 10% of them went on peritoneal dialysis, which is the major mode for home dialysis. Um, and less than 3% had a preemptive transplant. So the goal is to go from 13% in 2017 to 80% in 2025. And um, that's a, a new definition for optimism. So, the good news is that age-specific incidence rates um, for ESKD have leveled off, and you can see that in this slide, project, and it's projected all the way through 2030. And, um, but if you're thinking about nephrology as a subspecialty, don't lose heart, because as you can see, the population is expected to obviously age through the baby boomer effect with 10,000 baby boomers a day turning age 65, and generally increased lifespan, although certain categories have had a little bump in that road due to the opioid epidemic. The good news for um, budding nephrologists is, um, unfortunately, we're getting fatter, 
And with rising obesity comes an increased incidence of diabetes, which as you'll see in a minute, um, contributes to the prevalence of ESRD or ESKD uh, over time. And so here are four scenarios. One is that the two on the top is with people getting fatter, but the death rate either staying constant or declining. And you can see that there's still uh, plenty of patients uh, and the prevalence is growing. And in the way optimistic scenario with obesity getting less, and also with constant death rates or declining death rates, we still have a growth, although not as significant. So this is the general proportion of um, CKD in the US. Um, it hasn't really changed over the last 20 years, but as you can see, the vast majority is in CKD one, two, and three, and really a little over a million people um, have CKD four and five, which is what we see in the hospital and what um, really causes a lot of the morbidity and, obvious, and obviously mortality. Most of us are seeing this cohort uh, of CKD three, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And just to remind you what these definitions are, CKD1 is evidence of kidney damage with normal or increased GFR. And um, you can read the rest of these certainly as well as I can. Um, this is sort of the relative risk. It's the red, yellow, salmon, red. And I, I'm not sure what you would call this, but it's bad. So what you can see is that until you get to a GFR of less than 60, if you have normal microalbuminuria, uh, which is under 30, um, you, you really don't have any greater risk for this problem. And even if you have mild to moderate CKD3, which is what almost all of our elderly patients have, because the way the formula works is the older you get, even if your creatinine stays stable, um, your EGFR calculation keeps going down using the CKD epi calculation that's reported on Georgetown lab results. So the key here is to measure albuminuria and or proteinuria, and you can order a, um, microalbumin to creatinine ratio, and you should on urine, just like you order normal uh, urinalysis as part of a standard physical, uh, because that's gonna give you the kind of information that suggests when you might pull the trigger. So what causes um, ESKD? And while all of us um, are really excited about dealing with weird and wonderful glomerulonephritides, the bulk, 75% of ESKD, is caused by diabetes and hypertension. And that's really where we're going to spend the bulk of the time in terms of renal protection and preventing the complications. So what's the effect of diabetes? You can see here that if you don't have diabetes, the prevalence of kidney disease is relatively low, uh, as I showed you earlier. But if you do have diabetes, it's really four times as high. And <clears throat> the manifestations of uh, kidney disease in the diabetic population, um, as you can see, is substantially greater with albuminuria. A substantial fraction have an impaired GFR and um, an unfortunate few have both. And this is not good for your long-term survival. So this is the 10-year standardized, which means standardized for race, age, and sex. Um, if you, with no kidney disease, and you can see that it's 10 times as likely to die within 10 years if you have an impaired GFR and albuminuria. And the important thing to note is that 
CKD patients are more likely to die than to progress to dialysis. And what this is, is a five-year follow-up study of people that started with a GFR of 60 to 89, um, with no proteinuria, proteinuria, and as you can see. And what, what this kind of pinkish um, bar is really that even people that have GFR is 15 to 39, which is stage four CKD. Um, less than one in five of them went on to renal replacement therapy. They all, they all died prior to transplant or dialysis, or they were um, event free. So um, we need to keep our eye on the, on the ball with in terms of CV, CVD and um, its protection and the risk factors involved. As you can see, um, cardiovascular dis disease represents 54% of people that the eight year mortality rate in people that have elevated creatinines. Um, only a small percentage is due to renal causes. And this is the general um, mortality rate in the population. And people on dialysis, regardless of um, whether you're black or white, male or female, you can see from this graph and what, that people on dialysis have a much higher um, mortality rate. Um, although obviously since everybody dies, the closer you get to, or the older you get, the more these curves are going to uh, converge. So the American Heart Association has traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And again, uh, there are things you can't do very much about. Increasing age is a good thing. Um, your sex is what it is biologically, and we won't get into other manifestations of that. Um, we can control your blood pressure. We can control your, H, your LDL. Um, we can help you raise your HDL. We can treat diabetes. We can hope, hope to convince you to stop smoking, not be sedentary. Uh, menopause, we don't really want to do much about, and we can't alter your genetic history, uh, but we can deal with your LVH. There are also non-traditional risk factors that you probably heard a bit about. Um, homocysteine levels from smoking, albuminuria, uh, various, in, hereditary lipoprotein disorders, uh, anemia, et cetera. And you can read this. The, the oxidative stress is something that, as many of you may know, we do a fair amount of research here at Georgetown about. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wilcox, the former, our former division chief, uh, does a lot of this, um, as well as endothelial dysfunction uh, due to altered nitric oxide balance. So there is a study looking at cardiovascular mortality and um, what the risk is. And it was called the Cardiovascular Health Study. And they looked at uh, about 5,800 people who were older than 65. <clears throat> about a fifth of them had an EGFR that was less than 60. And they had a mortality rate that was twice that of people uh, without chronic kidney disease. However, the, the interesting factor in an article that Mike Schil Schlepak from UCSF wrote, the traditional risk factors were predictors of death, but the non-traditional risk factors were not. So the, it turns out that the cardiovascular risk factors that we talked about are also common complications of chronic kidney disease. And as you can see, stage four kidney disease, over 80% are hypertensive. Um, almost 60% are anemic. And you can see that these are fairly um, significant as we sort of march through the progression of uh, chronic kidney disease. So what are the targets that we wanna look at? Um, and we'll talk about these as we go along. Basically, less than 140 over 80, um, if you're less than 
50, uh, and you don't have albuminuria. If you do have albuminuria, you want it to be less than 30. Uh, proteinuria, we try to keep to less than uh, 500 milligrams. If you're diabetic, we want to keep your A1C less than 7. We want to get the non-HDL cholesterol under 100. And then obviously things like don't get fat, don't smoke, and exercise. And for proteinuria, especially if you're diabetic, we recommend um, an ACE or an ARB. Uh, so how good are we at doing this? Well, as a group, we're pretty good if the patients don't have chronic kidney disease. And this is from the National uh, Health and, and Nutrition Examination Survey, better known as NHANES. And there were four different waves of, of that. The last ended in 2014. And over 80% of patients uh, were at target blood pressure uh, over time, slight increase into 2014. But if you had a GFR less than 60, or you had um, albuminuria greater than 30, uh, you can see we didn't do a very good job because less than 50 of those people um, were at target blood pressure. Now, it says here that we should use an ACE or an ARB. And there are some people that thought that, well, if we start with an ACE and that doesn't get the job done to get the proteinuria down, um, we could just go with the, if some is good, more is better theory of medicine. And we could just give um, an ARB as well. And so there was a study called the Nephron D study that was done at the VA. And they said, yeah, that's not such a good idea. And what you can see here is that there was a statistically significant difference between those people given an ACE and an ARB versus those given just, in this case, uh, an ARB. Uh, and that was for AKI and also for hospitalization due to hyperkalemia. And the, and the uh, statistical significance was 0 0.001, which should suggest that we don't do, do it. So in addition to the blood pressure, we'll, there are people that would suggest you should put these people on a low sodium diet. Um, and the recommendation is 2,400 milligrams unless you have hypertension and some other things, and then it's less than two grams per day. Um, anybody that has tried to achieve that uh, in the United States, is, that with, with free living patients knows that it's challenging at best. You also wanna treat increased cholesterol, avoid nephrotoxic drugs, um, correct anemia, and of course treat acidosis, which is bicarbonate less than 20 to 22. However, there are recent articles in the New England Journal of Medicine that would suggest that the sodium strategy may not be exactly right. So I think it's at this point that we're gonna see if Aaron was able to technologically come up with showing our poll. So this is a quick poll? question. Go ahead. You do see it, the poll? Yes, right. I can. Uh, so if these are, what's the number one source of sodium in the American diet? And the choices are savory snacks, which is a fancy way of saying pretzels, potato chips, and things of that ilk, cheese, bread, or processed meat. So give everybody a chance to um, vote. And um, several years ago, I was on a National Academy of Medicine uh, panel that was charged with strategies to reduce sodium in the American diet. Um, and one of the interesting factoids <clears throat> that I learned was the answer to this question. So the group was evenly divided between savory snacks, bread, and processed meat. Well, they're all good choices. Um, what's interesting is um, cheese actually has a fair amount of sodium in it, um, and, but bread is the correct answer. And the and part of the reason is that um, one of the things that's in bread is something called sodium benzoate, which is a preservative, which, is, which allows 
um, Wonder Bread to stay on the shelves for weeks rather than a shorter period of time. Um, and what it sounds like a bunch of you all were cognizant of, but which I was completely naive to, is it turns out that um, west of the Appalachians and east of the Rockies, Americans consume an enormous quantity of bread on a daily basis. So it's not only the amount of sodium, but the amount of bread that's consumed relative to um, pretzels and uh, potato chips. So this was from the New England Journal of Medicine and um, the average American diet is right here. It is four to six grams of sodium a day. And just to put it in um, some perspective or in units that you might be more familiar with, um, four grams of sodium is equal to 10 grams of salt, which is basically two teaspoonfuls of salt. So, um, and as an aside, for those of you that are managing patients with hyponatremia and you want them to increase their salt, uh, that's a measure that virtually everybody understands, teaspoons. But what I wanna call your attention to is this thing that's highlighted in red, um, which hopefully describes um, everybody that's listening or that can hear this. Um, this was a very low risk cohort and excluded people who had prior cardiovascular disease, who had uh, been prescribed medica medications for cardiovascular disease, had a history of cancer, diagnosis of cancer, were smokers, or had diabetes. So basically, you're very healthy American. And what you can see is that if they consumed the amount of sodium that's recommended um, by a variety of government agencies, i.e. 2,400 milligrams, their risk of death or major cardiovascular events, better known as MACEs, um, was 1.62, as contrasted to those in that cohort that consumed four to six grams of sodium a day. So it, it's, very, um, it's very controversial as to whether people that do not have things like salt-sensitive hypertension um, really need to uh, decrease their salt to the levels uh, that people are talking about. So when we talk about blood pressure control, what are we doing? So there are, th there are three major trials that you should be familiar with. The first is the ACCORD trial, which was done in diabetics. And there were two groups. There was an intensive group where the goal was to get to less than 120 systolic. Uh, there was a standard therapy group, which is less than 140 systolic. And they actually did very, very well. They got down to 119 and 134. Interestingly, the mean GFRs in the intensive group were lower, although the proteinuria was also lower. And most importantly, there was no difference in the progression to end-stage disease. Ask was a trial uh, in African-Americans. And what's interesting here is that the intensive group goal was basically the same as the standard care group in Accord. Um, so the difference in progression was only seen if there, if there was proteinuria among the recipients. So along came Sprint, which hopefully everybody has heard of, and they had a, they looked at 3,000 patients, um, 50 years and older from Sprint that had CKD at baseline, and more versus less intensive blood pressure lowering. And the target, just to refresh you, is your memory was less than 120 versus less than 140. Um, so the intensive target produced a significant decrease in all-cause mortality and a non-significant reduction in cardiovascular events, although more patients in the intensive group had a 30% or larger decline in EGFR. Uh, the rates of end-stage disease or 
decline in kidney function were similar between the two groups. The key thing here is that SPRINT measured the blood pressure in a way that was very different than the way we measure it in the clinic. Basically, the patient or the subject was put in a room by themselves with an automated blood pressure cuff, and over 15 minutes, um, their blood pressure was taken three times an average. And in essence, um, that, that translates, that 120 translates into um, a blood pressure of about 128 or 130 in the real world. And that's based on work that was actually done in a, by one of the physicians in our division who's at the, uh, at the VA. So does it matter how you get your blood pressure down? This slide makes it pretty clear that regardless of the achieved systolic blood pressure, if you decrease blood pressure um, with uh, using a RAS blockade, you can uh, attenuate the progression uh, to CKD. And just to remind everybody, um, when, you, when you use drugs that block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, you're at risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, all of us know about chronic kidney disease and type 4 RTA with diabetes, but it's these drugs uh, that we sometimes forget about things that are commonly used like trimethoprim and pentamidine, as well as, as NSAIDs that can increase uh, the potassium. So typically people are somewhat leery of prescribing uh, an ACE or an ARB when there's um, less than normal renal function. With this rather busy slide, uh, which I apologize for, um, the point that this makes clear is that the line here that C is people with normal kidney function. As you can see, there's really no change in the creatinine. And line B is someone that starts off with an elevated creatinine, and there's a minor increase in the creatinine. But these are people that do not have volume depletion, do not have heart failure, or decreased effective intravascular volume or bilateral renal artery stenosis, which is the same thing. Those are the people in whom you do need to be concerned about starting an ACE or an R because there you will increase uh, their creatinine. So what difference does all of this make? Well, there's a very interesting study recently published in the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology looking at something called the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Cohort, or CRIC, study. And this is the mean time, median time spent in the various stages of CKD. And then what happens if you don't do the things that we were talking about? So you can see here clearly, with an elevated uh, blood pressure, you spend 6.1 years less in CKD stage 3A, which basically wipes out your cushion. So it's, you lose 6.1 of 7.9, uh, and it's the same percentage decrease here as well. Uh, and for poorly controlled diabetes, this is um, a problem as well. And so uh, there is a study called the, the DAPA CKD study, which uh, many of you may have already seen. It was published in the New England Journal uh, two weeks ago, and it was published online about six to eight weeks ago. And um, basically, this is uh, dapagliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, and basically, they looked at a primary outcome, which is a decline in the EGFR, of at least 50% or, or progression to end-stage kidney disease or death from renal or cardiovascular uh, causes. So this is the, uh, and by the way, this trial was stopped early because it was unethical to continue because dapagliflozin did such a good job. The point here is that 
you can control, um, and this was in diabetics and non-diabetics, um, you can control uh, the primary outcome. There is a, obviously a statistically significant difference. If you just look at renal progression, there is also a statistically significant uh, difference. And if you look at the cardiovascular outcomes, there was a statistically significant difference. And just to remind you, um, this is the sodium glucose uh, transporter two is blocked in the proximal tubule. So as a result, you have glycosuria, which has all of these positive effects, uh, negative caloric balance, decreased hemoglobin A1C, which has these secondary effects. And also by blocking um, sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule, you induce a naturesis, which has a positive effect on blood uh, pressure. Uh, it, it decreases afferent arterial or constriction, and that decreases intraglomerular hyperfiltration, uh, intraglomerular hypertension and hyperfiltration, which is probably the reason for the effect on progression and also has some other uh, cardiovascular effects. So um, SGLT2s really are not widely diffused. Um, our endocrinologic colleagues don't use them. Insurance companies don't like to pay for them, uh, but they're clearly um, something that's going to become more widely uh, used a as a primary tool, both in diabetics and increasingly in non-diabetics. So lipid lowering as the arena protective strategy, I just want to emphasize that there is um, really no evidence that lipid um, is renal protect lipid lowering is renal protective, but um, because of the fact that, as we said earlier, more people die of cardiovascular disease than of kidney disease with CKD, um, we use them. There's also some. Uh, there is a study called Sharp, uh, which reported a benefit uh, in terms of decreased cardiovascular uh, risk in both dialysis. Uh, it, when you look at it cumulatively, it was in both dialysis and non-dialysis patients. When you break out the forest plot, you can see that there's only a statistically significant uh, decrease in risk um, with the azotembi simvastatin uh, group. In, in patients that were non-dialysis, which is why that's what the FDA approved it for. So a lot of our patients, as I'm sure you've noticed, are not well nourished. Their um, albumin levels are low. And uh, if we increase their albumin from less than 3.5 to greater than four, we could um, save as many as 1,400 lives and 20,000 hospital days and a bunch of money for Medicare. And frequently people, I'm sure, will ask you, well, is there anything I can do with my diet? Uh, and the answer is you should meet these nutritional goals of roughly 1.2 grams per kilogram per day of protein um, if you have a GFR over 30 or 0 0.8 if you have a GFR less than 30. And you should get roughly uh, 30 to 35 kilocalories per kilogram per day uh, of protein in order to avoid malnutrition. So everybody knows that people with severe CKD are anemic. Uh, the reason is that the kidneys are unable to produce erythropoietin. And uh, this anemia develops early, worsens as CKD progresses. And I want to stress it's normochromic and normocytic. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you that I've gotten hematology consults that say that this is a patient that has uh, does, the anemia is due to CKD and they're hypochromic and macrocytic, and that's not CKD. Anyway. Um, Part of the, the uremic toxin shorten the, the life of the red blood cell. 
Uh, and concomitantly, we see iron and other nutritional deficiencies. And we also see that uh, patients with CKD have high degrees of baseline inflammation, uh, which um, causes the increase in abscidin, which, um, as you'll see, increases ferritin and decreases effective iron metabolism. Having said what I did earlier, it's very embarrassing if you are a nephrologist and you have a patient that has a low GFR and you ascribe their anemia um, to CKD only to discover that they have a tumor or, they have, or they're hypothyroid. So typically, if a patient is anemic, and the, according to the most recent WHO um, definitions, that's less than 11 uh, grams of hemoglobin in females, less than 12 in males. You should, at the very least, look for um, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, get a CBC, look at the reticulocyte count, get an iron, a transferrin saturation, ferritin, total iron binding capacity, check for fecal occult blood, make sure the patient is up to date in cancer screening and make sure they're not hypothyroid. Obviously, if they're iron de deficient, we should replete their iron. Uh, if they are not iron deficient, we can treat with an erythropoietin stimulating agent. Uh, if the hemoglobin is less than uh, 9.4 uh, and we wanna raise it to above 10. And the reason for some of this is uh, there are benefits to ESAs that work over here at the early stages of erythropoiesis. And the benefits are decreased transfusion, which if the patient progresses to ESKD um, is a good thing because it makes them better able to get a transplant because it doesn't sensitize them. There is evidence to suggest that quality of life improves and the patients generally feel better and have a higher functional status. On the other side of the equation, um, there's evidence of increased blood pressure with ESAs. Um, the latest trials, uh, something called TREAT, showed an evidence of car increased risk of cardiovascular events if you raise the hemoglobin too high and an increased risk of stroke. For iron, one of the key benefits is that it reduces the need for ESAs. Obviously, it increases hemoglobin in iron deficient patients, uh, and iron repletion is a good thing. Uh, the risks are that it's pretty clear that you can have, if you give too much, you have tissue deposition, which is bad. Um, and then it increases oxidative stress uh, fairly uniformly. And um, there are those who believe that um, iron is miracle growth for bacteria and so that there is an increased risk of infection. So just a little bit of simple arithmetic. Um, if you have a patient with a hemoglobin of eight and you wanna raise them to 10, which is the current recommendation, um, assuming a blood volume of three to five liters um, and you, this is the two gram per deciliter increase in, in hemoglobin, which if you do the arithmetic is 60 to 100 grams of total body hemoglobin. Um, you can look up and find out that hemoglobin is 0.34% iron. And if you do all this arithmetic, you realize that you need roughly about 200 to 350 milligrams of iron. Um, and that normal iron stores are about 1000 milligrams. So when you assess iron status, um, you need to look at transferrin saturation and that measure, measures circulating iron. Um, if you look in MedConnect, you won't find a checkbox for transferrin saturation. So you have to get an iron and a total iron binding capacity. Um, you divide one by the other and you get a, a TSAT. And if it's less than 20, um, I'm sorry, if it's, if it's less than 20, you should um, give iron, and you don't want to give uh, iron if it's over 50. As for serum ferritin, that measures existing iron stores, but it's not a very good measure uh, because it's an acute phase reactant, 
And if you have um, inflammation, uh, it will uh, increase your ferritin levels. Currently, we treat um, kidney disease patients that are not on dialysis, uh, that are treated with ESAs, need iron. Uh, supplemental iron should be about 200 milligrams of elemental iron a day. And while there are multiple forms of oral iron, I will tell you that um, if you can keep, most of us use ferrous sulfate, but that's three tablets to get to um, the 200 milligrams a day because there's only 65 milligrams per pill. Um, patients don't take this uh, very regularly. And if you're quick to notice, you'll see, well, wait a minute, I only need to give one pill of ferric citrate and that gets me what I need with one pill, and we all know that adherence is better. The only little problem is that ferric citrate is very expensive, and um, you, prior, you generally need to get prior authorization when you order it. And full disclosure, I was on the scientific advisory board that helped these people um, get on the market. So we're going to wrap up with um, bone and mineral metabolism. These are the guidelines for uh, calcium and phosphorus, as well as PTH. Basically, um, you like to get calcium to normal limits, phosphorus to normal limits, and PTH to two to nine times the upper limit of normal. Why do we want to treat phosphorus? Well, increased phosphorus causes death. This study showed that for every one milligram per deciliter increase in phosphate, phosphate there is a 23% increase in the risk of death. And just to show you the numbers, so we usually treat phosphates that are greater than five, usually about 5.5 is the treatment threshold. Um, and you can see that by that point in time, the increased risk of death is fairly great. So why do we do this? Why do we wait until 5.5? Um, it's because it's hard to treat, and for non-on dialysis patients, calcium acetate is what's usually uh, needed. Uh, but because of vascular cal calcification problems, um, you want to keep elemental calcium below uh, two grams. Uh, it also matters where the phosphorus comes from, and on this right-hand side, you can see that if you get your phosphorus from plant sources, you have a much smaller impact on your serum phosphorus than you do if you get it from meat. And this is just a reminder that phosphorus varies during the day and is greatest uh, in the evening. So there is a study that looked at phosphate binders. Um, and basically, this was in people that had CKD but not E. SKD, and they had phosphoruses between 3.5 and less than 6, and they used the existing uh, phosphate binders. And what this showed is that phosphate binders did their job, but there was also a progression in coronary artery abdominal uh, uh, and abdominal aortic calcification. So there's, um, that's the risk, and I already showed you the mortality benefit. Uh, so we can also give vitamin D to, lo to lower PTH levels, um, and there is no best formulation. Um, basically, we use calcitriol, which is generic and cheap, um, when we want to give vitamin D to decrease um, to decrease parathyroid levels. And so, just to quickly go over um, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Basically, uh, as kidney function decreases, FGF23 um, increases, which suppresses um, the hydroxylation of 125 vitamin D. And decreased vitamin D uh, increases phosphorus, as do, does an increased FGF23, which decreases calcium. And then, as you may remember, 
uh, it increases parathyroid hormone. And as you can see, as this goes on, you can, uh, the parathyroid gland uh, keeps uh, growing and proliferating and we get hyperplasia. Uh, so how do we treat this? This is the vitamin D receptor. We block it with vitamin D and we use calcium emetics like Sensopar or Etalcalcetide to block the calcium uh, receptor and decrease parathyroid hormone. But essentially, if this goes unchecked, you get um, monoclonal proliferation, and then these drugs don't work. So you need to jump on this early and aggressively and use both vitamin D and calcium emetics.